very happy to have Kaylin O'Connor here for our next presentation, and she will be presenting the emergence of intersectional disadvantage. Yeah, well, um, thank you so much for having me. Yes, the paper is called The Emergence of Intersectional Disadvantage, so I guess I will just dive right in. Um, so here are my co-authors to start. So Justin Bruner is a philosopher of science. He's appointed in um, the Department of Political Economy and Moral Science at University of Arizona. Liam Kofi Bright is another philosopher of science uh, appointed in philosophy, logic, and scientific method in um, London School of Economics. So as we go through, it'll become clear that Justin and I have more of a background in the sorts of models that the work in this talk is built around. And Liam is more the expert in intersectionality theory, though he's also a social modeling person of a different stripe. So we sort of came together to bring together this modeling approach with um, to address certain issues or questions raised in intersectionality theory. And that's how this co-authorship was formed. Okay, so let me start with like the tiniest bit of background on intersectionality theory. Here's a slogan that Liam came up with for an intersectional scholar. Don't theorize as if all women are white and all the blacks are men. And this responds to a 1982 feminist text titled All Women Are White, All Blacks Are Men, But Some of Us Are Brave about the experiences of black women and the ways these didn't always just sort of follow directly from their experiences as women and as black people. So the sort of most basic idea here is that if your identity comes at the intersection of multiple disadvantaged or de uh, oppressed identities, um, so if you're not just a woman, if you're not just black, but you're a black woman, this may require special theorizing to understand. And there may be special ways in which you are disadvantaged or oppressed as a result of this intersectional identity. So here's a related quote from Christy Dotson. Um, there exists a tendency to theoretically erase the experiences of oppression that are invoked as a result of being black women and not merely being black or a woman. And from this Oxford Handbook article by Patricia Hill Collins and Valerie Chet, we have this claim, systems of power cannot be understood in isolation from one another. Instead, systems of power intersect and co-produce one another to result in unequal material realities and the distinctive social experiences that characterize them. So again, to understand oppression, you can't just look at what it is to be in separate oppressed identity groups or systems of power, but at how these systems intersect and come together is you know, one of the main claims here. So um, intersectionality theory has now been around for several decades and has been tremendously influential it's been extended to think about many sorts of intersecting identities. So not just race and gender, though those are you know, sort of core ones, but also things like class, um, socioeconomic status, disability, sexual orientation, et cetera. Okay, so what are we doing in this paper? Well, what we do here is look at simulation models of cultural evolution to explore intersectional oppression and its emergence over cultural time. And in doing so, we use the models to address or respond to a number of criticisms or worries from the literature about intersectionality theory. So in particular, as we'll see in this talk, we build some minimal, really simple models that can produce intersectional oppression and ask what can these tell us about this branch of theory? Okay, so here's a roadmap for the rest of the talk. So first I'll discuss some of these methodological issues that have been raised for intersectionality theory. Second, I'll introduce the modeling framework we've been using. So this is part two, size and power, um, and discuss how in this framework we can capture simple models of social identity groups and how inequities can emerge between these groups. And in particular, I'll talk about a few features of groups that can um, impact this emergence of inequ inequity or discrimination between groups. And that'll be the sort of setup for the next section, part three, modeling intersectional oppression, where we build some simple kind of minimal models of how you could get intersectional disadvantage emerging over cultural evolutionary time. 
And then in part four, I return to these issues raised in part one, this is models and methods, and show how these models bear on these methodological debates in intersectionality theory. Okay, so with that, on to part one, methodological issues. Okay, so let me um, start here with a clarificatory note. So there are many branches of intersectionality theory. And if you're familiar with these at all, you might be thinking, well, this is sort of a strange approach to thinking about intersectionality theory because a lot of this theorizing is done in more qualitative traditions. So for example, might look at what it is like phenomenally to occupy some disadvantaged intersectional identity. And a lot of this theorizing focuses on complexities and intricacies of social life. Whereas social models of the sort we're gonna be applying here tend to eliminate or downplay complexity and tend to ignore things like individual experience. But the sort of branch of intersectionality theory we're mostly interacting with here is a tradition that uses experimental and large scale sociological research that is attuned to intersectional theory. So it tries to look at data from large populations to ask, can we see, are there real intersectional advantages or sorry, disadvantages for um, groups that are at the intersection of otherwise disadvantaged um, social identities. Okay. I mentioned there have been some issues raised for this tradition and here I'll discuss four related to sample size, defining methodology, circularity, <clears throat> and defining what counts as non-additive advantage. So let me just talk through these a little bit. So first, sample size. Um, in general, testing social theories requires obtaining adequate samples. So this means getting enough research subjects and of the right sort to study the kinds of questions you're looking at. And it's been pointed out that when you start exploring detailed intersections of identity groups, this can be increasingly difficult, especially if you want to look at the ways more and more identities can sort of intersect and produce disadvantage. So for example, suppose you want to do a study and your population is going to involve trans women of color and elite athletics. You start to get to a situation where the available sample size is very small. So Cole states this worry as to address intersectional questions, it's necessary to develop complex designs using prohibitively large sample sizes. So basically sample sizes that you can't always get when you wanna look at intersectional populations. So that's one methodological worry. A second one has to do with um, a lack of defined method in the field. So, the idea here is something like, uh, and this is a fairly general worry, maybe there isn't a good way to say what counts as a truly intersectional effect or what wouldn't count. Um, so if you can't say what, sorry, my cat is here, what would be a really intersectional effect, the worry is, well, maybe all these claims about intersectionality are pseudoscientific in some way. They can't be verified or falsified. Um, here's something from Patricia Hill Collins, who describes the experience of looking for intersectional work, I think, for a conference. And she writes, we thought we knew intersectionality when we saw it, but we couldn't define what it was. So is there some way to say um, what would be intersectional disadvantage and what wouldn't? And here, third, is a somewhat related, though not quite the same, critique which claims that poorly defined methodology might lead to theoretical vacuity. And some of this comes from Tommy Curry, who worries that when defining what's going on with intersectional populations, theorists sometimes appeal to behaviors and features that are to be explained. So one way you might do this is baking essentialist assumptions into identity categories. So saying something like, when we have an assertive group and another passive group interaction, interacting and we have this kind of process, then maybe we get inequity between them. And the worry is there that maybe by defining these groups in certain ways, you're already specifying that you're gonna have certain outcomes and thus there's no real empirical content to your claims. All right, 
So the fourth um, worry has to do with non-additive disadvantage. So one central claim of intersectionality theory has been that intersectional groups face non-additive disadvantage, that there's some way in which the disadvantage you face as maybe a black woman or a disabled person of low socioeconomic status might be more than the sum of the disadvantage you would face by being black and a woman or disabled and of low socioeconomic status. Um, but what does this sort of claim consist in? What does it mean for disadvantage to be non-additive? Some have argued that this lacks clear empirical content, that it would be hard to apply this kind of claim to a real study population. Without a clear way to do it, again, there's a worry about pseudoscientificness, you know, that there is some, it is poorly grounded to claim that you have this kind of non-additive intersectional advantage. Okay, so that lays out these theoretical worries. So now let's turn um, to our modeling framework. So what we do in this paper is draw on this tradition that uses game theory and bargaining games in particular to look at the cultural evolution of oppressive systems. So to ask, for example, how do oppressive systems emerge over cultural time as a result of human interactions? And this is a reasonable approach in many ways because these sorts of systems do tend to emerge over cultural time. They tend to be normative and conventional. So there are cultural rules that tend to emerge about, for instance, what sorts of people get more and what sorts of people get less when we have interactions where we split resources. So the basic model we use comes from this bargaining problem, which was first introduced by John Nash. So suppose there's some kind of good that people want to split. And this could be salaries in a company. It could be the amount of money produced by sharecroppers on land being split with the people who own the land. Um, it could be the amount of money produced in a household. It could be the amount of household labor. So there's something that has to be divided. And the problem in this sort of scenario is that there tend to be many ways you could divide things like this. So if you have two people dividing something, one of them could get more, the other could get more, they could both get about the same amount. Um, so they have to come to an agreement in order to get a successful split of a resource. There you have to bargain in some way. And if they can't, then they won't be able to presumably successfully divide the resource together. So you model this by supposing you have two players in this game who each make a request for some amount of resource. Um, and if their requests are compatible, they get what they want. And if they're incompatible, so if they're too jointly aggressive in their demands, they fail to come to a bargain and instead they get some lower fallback outcome, which is typically, typically called the disagreement point. So let me give a specific model of this kind of problem. So this is a version of the Nash demand game. Um, it's broadly employed as a model of two player bargaining. And this is what we call a mini game because it's a really simplified version of this game. So in this game, we'll say we have two players. We have player one and player two. Um, they're dividing a resource that we'll say has value of 10. We just arbitrarily chose that. And we'll say they can each make three sorts of requests for this resource. So player one can make a low request or an accommodating one, a medium request or a sort of fair one or a high request, a aggressive request. And same thing for player two. And then this table defines in this game what they get for any combination of requests with player one listed first. And so if their requests aren't too aggressive, again, they get what they requested. So if they both make low requests, here they each get a kind of payoff that matches that, a lower payoff. If they both make medium requests, the same thing. If one makes a high request and one makes a low request, the one who asked for high gets it and the one who asked for low gets it. But if they're too pushy, if they both request kind of high or medium, then they get a poor payoff, which we'll just say is zero. And in particular for this game, so for simplicity's sake, we'll say this is a value of 10. The medium will be a demand for half of it, for five. And the low and high demands, it doesn't matter so much what they are, but we'll say they're compatible, like for two and eight or four and six. So 
um, low here could be four and high here could be six. So let me ask, are there any questions at this point about this model? All right. Um, so this game has three, what are called pure strategy Nash equilibria. So I won't talk too much about what that means, but these are special pairs of strategies that are often used to predict what will happen when people bargain with each other in a scenario like this. So in this case, these are the strategies where they exactly divide the resource, where one gets high and the other low, where they both get medium, or the first one gets low and the other high. And these are equilibria of the game because they're pairings where neither player can switch what they're doing and do any better. So at these pairings, if one player, say player one, say they were here, switch to demanding less, they would just get less. So they can't switch to less and do better. If someone tried to switch to demanding more, say they were here, they would get this disagreement point and actually get less. So there's no way to change what you're doing and get any better. So for that reason, these sort of predict what will happen in models of bargains. So we start with these games and we look at models where you have groups of actors who are learning how to bargain with each other. And in particular, we look at models where they learn from their group members by imitating successful strategies. So you're demanding high and that's working for you. I'm gonna try demanding high as well. And then we run these models over time and see what happens when you have these groups who sort of start off at random starting points with no real rules of bargaining and learn in this way from each other and what sorts of rules of bargaining do they develop. And in particular, we're interested in models where we divide these groups into subgroups or bare representations of identity categories. So these could represent something like gender splits or racial divides. Um, and what we find across many different models of this sort is that when you have two groups like this who are learning to bargain with each other and evolving these sort of norms, conventions, or rules of bargaining in this game, there are basically three things that can happen. So the first is that one group ends up always demanding high and the other always demanding low when they meet. The second is that both groups make medium or fair demands against each other. And then the third is that that first group actually demands low and the second group high. So I'm gonna give a little uh, image to clarify this. So we'll call our two groups here the Sneetches, where we have the star-bellied Sneetches who have bellied with stars and the plain-bellied Sneetches with none upon theirs. And to be clear, um, you know, we're using these models to think about real identity groups, but I use Sneetches here for our groups because I wanna emphasize that in the models we're looking at, there aren't any complicated aspects of actual identity built into these models. Basically the groups don't have realistic properties. The main point of them being groups is that they're somehow marked as different like stars and plain bellies. And that matters to all the, you know, sort of interacting individuals in the group. They can tell that there are these different groups and that they're marked. So the outcomes we see, for example, might be that whenever a star-bellied Sneech and a plain-bellied Sneech meet, the star-bellied Sneech gets high and the plain-bellied Sneech gets low, or that they both get medium, or that we have the opposite split. Now, in previous work, <coughs> looking at similar models, Axtell et al. have called these outcomes one and three, where one group gets more and the other less systematically, a bare-bones representation of discrimination or discriminatory conventions. So what you have here are outcomes that emerge on their own, where the actors in the model are treating in-group and out-group members differently, and one out-group is systematically disadvantaged by the rules of bargaining that emerge. So that's how this becomes a kind of um, bare bones framework for thinking about identity-related disadvantage. All right, so now let's talk about a few variations. So this sort of model, um, has been widely employed to consider the emergence of discrimination or in inequity between groups because it has this kind of bare character where you just have identity groups, you have a bargain and you can get these kinds of discriminatory patterns. But people have also looked at different factors in this model, um, explored them for their role in the emergence of discrimination in this kind of model. And two factors I wanna talk about here that will then build into our intersectional models are group size and power. 
So let's talk about group size first. So one thing we can do in this model is make one group smaller than the other. And when you do that, you end up with this asymmetry in how they learn. Because when two groups interact, if you have a smaller group, they tend to learn more quickly about their art out group. And that's because they tend to have a larger portion of their interactions with out group members than the large group does. And let me just return to the sneeches to make really clear why this would be the case. So now suppose we have a larger group and a smaller group, and suppose they are interacting with each other, maybe they're dividing resources. Um, you know, first we might have this interaction with these two individuals, then we might have that one, then we might have this interaction, then we might have that interaction. So now um, everyone in the two groups has interacted with an outgroup member, but notice that each person over here has had only one interaction with their outgroup, and each person over here has had two interactions. And obviously I set up this kind of toy example to come out perfectly that way, but this is gonna be true whenever you have a larger and a smaller group, there's some number of interactions between them. In this case, it was four, but maybe it's 4,000. And on average, the smaller group is going to have had a larger number than the big group, and thus more opportunity to learn about the large group. So this kind of asymmetry can lead to cultural scenarios where you see one group gaining a systematic advantage over the other. So for instance, it has been pointed out that in many bargaining interactions, learning quickly can actually be harmful to a group. So what you often see in bargains is that there's an advantage to learning low, safe, accommodating demands when you don't know what your opponent is going to do. So in these sorts of models, you can see outcomes where the small group learns these low, safe demands. So they learn to demand low. And then large groups learn to take advantage of this. And this has been called the cultural red king effect. And my co-author, Justin Bruner, was sort of the first person to outline this effect. And then subsequently, um, he and I have looked at models of it and also at experiments with small and large groups bargaining where we've reproduced this effect. Here's an image showing what this might look like. So what we're looking at here are outcomes from cultural evolutionary models where we you know, created these kind of simulations and then ran through simulations many times and asked what kinds of conventions emerged in these simulated cultural groups. And on the x-axis, we're increasing the proportion of the population that's consisting of group one. So we're making one group bigger and bigger. And then on the y-axis, we see, well, how often do these three different possibilities for this model emerge? One group gets more, the other group gets more, or fair outcomes. And when the groups are equally sized, fair outcomes are very common. And each one is equally likely to discriminate against the other. But then as one group becomes larger and larger, fair outcomes become less common. It becomes increasingly common that the large group gets more because of this learning differential, that asymmetry that I just talked about. So that's this cultural red king effect. That's one way a feature of a group can lead it to have an advantage or a disadvantage in this kind of bargaining outcome. Kaylin, um, quick question about this. So yeah. in these in these studies, um, are the groups only interacting with members of the other group or are they also being paired with members of their own group? Yeah, thanks for asking. So I'm suppressing some details here. It doesn't matter that much, but usually in these models, we're allowing them to interact both with their in-group and the out-group. Um, so they are also developing sort of patterns of behavior in their in-groups. Then we focus on what's happening with the outgroup because basically if we want to look at like discriminatory outcomes or inequity between the groups, that's the only interaction that really matters. Yeah, so they are learning to specifically target the high demands at the other group and the same medium demands at their own group. Yeah, and typically what you see is that they do end up demanding medium in their own group and it's sort of a complicated reason for it, but it has to do with the fact that when you're in a single interacting group, the only way to always reach equilibria is for everyone to make medium demands. That's the only way to kind of coordinate how you're going to break apart the resource. Whereas when you have two groups, you have this asymmetry where you're in group one and you're in group two, and you can use that to divide the resource inequitably. Um, and so you usually see outcomes where they're fair with each other in their single groups, but then sometimes they're being unfair with the other group. 
So that's this size effect that we'll kind of use in the next section as like a way to think about how you could get intersectional disadvantage in these models. Um, I also want to talk about power in these models. So it's also been shown that if you create power differentials, more powerful groups tend to end up at advantage conventions of bargaining. And there are a lot of ways to work power into a model like this. So I'm just gonna talk about one that has to do with um, disagreement points. So this is a sort of traditional way of modeling power in bargaining games, where you say, if the bargain breaks down, if we have too much aggression on the two sides so that you get the disagreement point, one player is going to get a higher payoff. Now here I put a D to represent that. Then the other player who'll still get a low payoff. So power here translates to caring less about the success of a bargain. It doesn't matter so much to you. If the bargain breaks down, you're still going to do okay. Or else it translates to the ability to make another player care more about the success of a bargain. If the bargain breaks down, you're really going to be harmed. So we change these models by adding this disagreement point difference between the two groups. So now if bargaining breaks down, one group is going to get zero and the other is going to get some payoff higher than zero, which is D. And here is um, an image of outcomes for this kind of model that's very similar to the last one, but where what we're changing on the x-axis is how powerful one group is. So we make one group more and more powerful. Their disagreement point is higher and higher. They care less and less about wrecking the bargain. And as we do that, we see again, the sort of fair outcomes between the groups drop off. The outcomes where the powerful group gets more go up and the outcomes where the powerless group gets more basically disappear. So again, power can turn into bargaining advantage in the same way that size can turn into bargaining advantage in this sort of model. Okay, so to zoom out, now I've presented the modeling paradigm, the size and power effects, and we're going to use these to think about, okay, how could you get genuinely intersectional disadvantage in this sort of model? Is it easy to get that? Um, and if we do, how can we use that to think about some of these issues raised in the first part of the talk, these methodological issues? All right, so modeling intersectional oppression. So what we do in the paper here is test a few different sorts of assumptions about how intersectional populations develop bargaining conventions and see what happens in each case. And in particular, we sort of look at different levels of intensity of assumptions about how groups, about group structure and the importance of group structure. So we sort of add more and more importance to intersectional groups and ask what happens as we do that. So let me just talk through a kind of handful of models, how they work, how we make assumptions related to intersectionality and what comes out as a result. So here are some general questions to keep in mind throughout these models. When we create intersectional populations in these models are especially small groups, especially disadvantaged by this cultural red king effect under what conditions? Um, can power and group size compound when you have intersectional groups uh, to create special intersectional disadvantage? And when we see these kinds of intersectional disadvantages emerging, are they non-additive? Are they more than the sum of the disadvantage for the two minority or minority powerless groups? Um, and so those are the sort of questions that we're sort of looking at in these models. All right, so in general, across the models, we're gonna assume we have two dimensions of group membership. We do not go to more because things get very complicated very quickly. So this is sort of an image of the whole population. And you might say, well, there's one dimension of group membership and this could be gender. So this could be men and women in a workforce. Um, and then there's another dimension of group membership and maybe this is race. So this could be white people and black people in the same workforce. And then this creates four intersectional identity groups. Um, one that could be especially large, um, two others of moderate size, and then one small one. Or you could have the sizes be the same if you wanted, depending on what you're trying to model. 
But so then um, in that sort of toy example, this would be white men, this would be black women, this would be um, white women and black men. Okay, so I'm gonna use the sneeches again, just because it's sort of easier and emphasizes again, the fact that there aren't real identity categories in these models, but now I'll add intersectional types of sneeches. So we have our belly star type of identity, our non belly star type of identity, and we'll add some roughs to the sneeches. So now you could have a belly star red rough sneech, a plain belly red rough sneech, and the same with gray roughed sneeches. So ending up with four different intersectional groups. All right, so in our first model, we suppose, let's say there's two arenas of bargaining interaction. And in each of these, one aspect of identity is significant. So in one of them, belly stars are significant and in the other, the roughs are significant. And we'll assume that in each of these arenas, the actors pay attention to one aspect of their identity in choosing how they're gonna behave and in choosing who they're gonna imitate. So basically this is similar to running concurrently two models where you have groups here learning to bargain and then two other groups learning to bargain based on their intersections but we assume it's sort of all the same people who have these intersectional identities so this could be our population the four types of sneeches with their roughs and their belly stars and we could say, well, one thing they bargain over is how many hot dogs they get. And in that arena, they pay attention to belly stars and determining how many hot dogs they're gonna demand um, and in determining who they're gonna learn from when they're trying to figure out how many hot dogs do I demand. And then there's another arena where they bargain over how much time they get in the hammocks. And in this arena, they pay attention to their neck roughs and they also learn from others in their neck rough category about how to make demands over hammocks. I mean, obviously this is a completely stupid example, but hopefully you get the point. Um, so what we get in this model is two kinds of conventions emerging. So one emerges between the star bellies and the plain bellies about hot dogs and how much hot dog they get. And then another emerges between the gray roughs and the red roughs about hammocks and how much hammock time they get. So we have these two conventions. But for any particular intersectional group, they're gonna have different conventions than another group would. So it might be that these folks get always a lot of hot dog and always a lot of hammock time. And these folks get always a little bit of hot dog and a little bit of hammock time. And so we can ask about these kind of um, joint outcomes of this model. And what I'm showing here is that if we change the sizes of both groups, so here we're gonna make use of the size effect to think about intersectional disadvantage. If we change the sizes of both groups and we look at the different outcomes we can get, we see a cultural red king happening for both groups in a way that specially disadvantages the teeniest group. So as you know, sort of both groups become more disparate, the large, largest intersectional group tends to be demanding high all the time in all their interactions and the smallest intera intersectional group tends to almost never be demanding high in like very few interactions and then the sort of intermediate size groups demand high an intermediate amount of time and so this is a kind of intersectional effect kind of um so that's our sort of first model. It's not really a true intersectional effect though, since it's actually a combination of these two processes. You have two totally separate processes by which they're learning to bargain and two small groups end up being discriminated against and then you just kind of add that together. Um, so let's move to a different model where we sort of build off this one. You'll see why we can use the first one because we can compare this one to look at something that might be more genuinely intersectional. So we suppose, again, we have these different arenas of bargaining for which one aspect of identity is significant. So we have the belly stars and the hot dogs, the roughs and the hammocks, but we assume that actors only learn from those in their intersectional type. So when they look around and they say, what should I be doing in my bargains? They only look at people who are in their intersectional type. So they only learn from the gray plain bellies, if they're a green plain belly, right? And so for them, picking a cultural model now depends on intersectional identity rather than the two separate identities. 
Does that make sense as a different from, difference from the first model? Um, and let me know if you have questions. Again, just please feel free to jump in. I know this gets a little complicated. So now they're only you know, picking imitative models out of each intersectional group. And in this model, you know, we make this kind of small change, we see a much stronger effective intersectional advantage and disadvantage, where now the largest group is getting high in both arenas the vast majority of the time when it's very large, and the smallest group very, very rarely. Um, so this is sort of a stronger model of group identity and we see more intersectional disadvantage. And this occurs because once actors are only imitating their intersectional type, the size difference between the types in each process is much more dramatic. So now the smallest group is very, very small and they're learning very quickly about these other large groups. And the largest group is very, very big and they're learning slowly about the other groups. And that kind of strengthens the size effect. We look at a third model where we say, well, let's just suppose there's one arena of bargaining and everyone is really conditioning what they do and who they imitate on, who they imitate only on these intersectional types. So they're basically acting as if there are four groups in this model, you know, the star belly reds, the star belly grays, the plain belly, you know, each of these four. And every time we interact, I treat each of those as its own group and I only learn from my own group. So this model is quite different because now basically it's a model with four different groups and where conventions emerge between each of these four groups. So there's a rule about how the gray ruffed star bellies treat the red ruffed plain bellies and how they treat the gray ruffed plain bellies. And that's the case across every pair of possible groups that can interact. So suddenly the conventions you get in this model become much more complicated than the conventions you can get in these previous models. In general, a lesson we learned from building these models was like, wow, things get complicated very fast as soon as you add any of these intersectional types. And there are a lot more choices you have to make than we sort of thought there would be. But anyway, so now we have these more complicated outcomes. Um, so they're not directly comparable to the other two models. But what we can ask is something like, as you know, these identity groups become disparate in size, what's the average payoff in general for each group? And again, we find a intersectional effect here, um, looking now at average payoff, where the largest group now gets the highest average payoff and the smallest group the lowest and the intermediates get sort of intermediate average payoff. So again, we have an intersectional effect arising in this different sort of strong assumptions about group identity model. And I'll mention one last model that is somewhat more realistic, though still very simplified, where we say, okay, we're going to have two groups, and we'll suppose that one, sorry, two intersectional categories. We'll suppose that for one, there's a minority status, and the other a power differential between the identities. So we might imagine that, um, one identity group you could be part of is Latino or white. And in the workplace, Latinos are in the minority. And another in, uh, identity group you might be part of is gender. So you might have men and women and they interact in the home and women are relatively low power in that interaction. And so we look at models here where we again have these two areas, arenas of interaction, but in one we have size differences and one we have power differences. And then we ask what happens for the um, dis small and disempowered intersectional group. And we find this kind of compounding effect where that group is especially, again, disadvantaged. So again, we have kind of intersectional disadvantage for them. And to display this, this is a sort of different graph um, because now what we're changing is not just size for two groups, but size for one and power for the other. But the main takeaway here is that as one group becomes very large and more powerful, another group becomes very small and disempowered and two other groups are sort of intermediate. The small disempowered group, again, is very unlikely to be getting a lot out of the bargain and the large empowered group is very likely to be getting a lot out of the bargain. Okay, so to sum this all up, 
we find that intersectional groups can be specially disadvantaged in these models, both as a result of group size and power. We find that stronger assumptions of group identity lead to stronger effects of this sort. So we do find that using this kind of framework, you can get intersectional advantage, sorry, disadvantage emerging from different kinds of causes, basically. All right, so with that, let's go back to these kind of methodological issues and ask how we can respond to some of them using models like this or possibly models that would build off of these. So as I've been noting all along, these are highly idealized and extremely simple models compared to complex intersectional interactions. So we have to be kind of thoughtful about what we can do with them, what conclusions we can draw from them. Um, and the way we've used them is as a proof of purpose in certain ways about what sorts of models can be built, what kinds of effects you can get, and use these to respond to some of the claims that I raised earlier. So first, let's talk about sample size. So obviously, this kind of model is completely unconstrained with respect to sample size. And so we take this to be a kind of proof of purpose for the use of models to think about more realistic intersectional effects without restraints on sample. And in particular, you could use this kind of model to think about many intersectional identities, um, particularly small ones in the real world. And furthermore, you'd have relatively little trouble and expense doing so. You wouldn't have to hunt down, you know, the very small group of elite, low SES, women, athletes, blah, blah, blah. Um, sorry, every pet is apparently very needy today. Come here, Marla. Uh, all right, good. So second, one thing that our models um, and others can do is provide theoretically grounding empirical hypotheses for what sorts of causal processes can lead to genuinely intersectional disadvantage. And I put this citation here because we've actually used this sort of model to do this in the past. So we've used models of the cultural red king effect um, to say, well, these models give us this theoretical reason to think that small groups might sometimes get less in bargains. And that gave us a reason to go into the lab and look at what happens when small and large groups interact in the lab and to actually find a cultural red king effect in the lab. So we think this kind of model can do the same thing with intersectionality theory. It can say, here are the kinds of causes that would lead you know, intersectional groups to have special disadvantage that's different from maybe the sum or you know, individual disadvantages you might see them facing. And you can then use those hypotheses to go test for that kind of advantage. Um, and this sort of claim that comes out of these models is clearly verifiable or falsifiable. And I think this answers worries that were brought up in the first section about failures of methodological definition and also about vacuity or circularity in intersectionality theory because these models say, no, you can have small group sizes for two intersectional groups causing special disadvantage. And that's clearly a claim that can be empirically tested and maybe falsified. Um, relatedly, this is pretty similar, we present hypotheses for the emergence of disadvantage that are clearly not circular or vacuous. So this is responding to worries from Curry. Um, and this is basically the point I just made, sorry. I, <laughs> buried the lead on that. Um, so you could have groups in a lab play the Nash demand game and create a low power and a small intersectional group and see if those intersectional members earned less on average. And you could see whether that was true or not. And notice that the disadvantage here that occurs for the intersectional group is not baked into the definition of the groups, but caused by properties of the groups. So you don't say we have a group that's good at bargaining and then they get more bargaining. You say we have a group that has this power property or the size property, and then they get this kind of advantage. And last, I think the sort of the most interesting, when we built these models, um, we found that they actually provided concrete ways to say what you might mean by not additive disadvantage. 
because they gave a substantive framework for thinking about one way in which identity groups can be disadvantaged, which is by this sort of emergence of bargaining norms. And this responds to these worries by both Collins and Matua. So if you look in our models, you can give concrete definitions and say, well, here's what I mean by non-additive disadvantage. I mean that if you look across all these outcomes, the likelihood of discrimination for Black women is more than that for either Black men or white women. So that might be one thing you mean. Or you could say, here's what I mean by non-additive disadvantage. The likelihood of discrimination for Black women is more than that for a person who is discriminated against at the rate for Black people and for women at the same time. And you could use either of those and say, here are two ways of thinking about what non-additive disadvantage means. And if I look at a study population, I can show that this way or that way is there in that study population. And I'll highlight one more argumentative rules for the model, um, which responds less to these earlier methodological concerns and just more an interesting one. And that they show how intersectional disadvantage can in principle arise from very minimal conditions. So in some ways, the fact that these models are so simple is a disadvantage for them because we don't think they're gonna be the most realistic representation of real world groups. But the fact that they're so simple also shows kind of fact, it shows that intersectional disadvantage can emerge from very little, very few preconditions, which has empirical import on its own. So the conditions that generate this disadvantage in our model are that we have intersectional identity groups, that they bargain, and that you have cultural evolution towards strategies that work well for individuals. And these are kind of minimal conditions. And from this, you get special bad effects for intersectional groups. So knowing that you can get these effects from so little may inter indicate that like when you're thinking about intervening on intersectional disadvantage, you might not always be able to do so by aiming at higher level stuff like psychological biases. So it might be that like, you train people not to be biased, but disadvantage can still emerge from these lower level sort of structural properties, like just learning to do what's best for you. And so there might be more you have to do. Um, and so I think they can play a kind of argumentative role along those lines as well. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up. So I'll just sum up. We do find that in these simple cultural evolutionary models, you can get special intersectional disadvantage. It can arise under many modeling assumptions. Um, we find that it tends to increase under stronger intersectional assumptions or social identity group assumptions, like how important is your intersectional identity group. And we think that while these models should not be applied directly to real populations, they can be used to respond to some worries in the literature about intersectionality as a sociological methodology. With that I will say thank you. All right, thank you so much, Kaylin. That was a really interesting talk. Um, so we can now open up the floor to questions. If anyone wants to chime in, raise your hand or either just take yourself off of mute or raise your hand. Um, so also the question. So I was um, I was wondering in your model, you look at these um, two different parameters that could affect the um, how intersectionality is impacting payoff outcomes. So one is power and the other is group size. And I was wondering, is there a one-to-one -one mapping between them in the sense that for each power parameter, is there a group size that would generate identical payoff impact? Or is, are there any qualitative differences in this role of power versus the role of group size in creating intersectional disadvantage? Yeah, there are qualitative differences. I mean, it's basically just creating two different sorts of models where a different sort of feature can lead to disadvantage for a group. Um, so, First of all, with power in general, it's a, you know, I would say across many different models, it's a stronger effect and sort of a more dependable effect that um, increasing power and different ways of operationalizing it into the model tends in general to advantage a group and in a stronger way. Whereas group size is a little more of a um, conditional effect. So you can have different versions of the model where they're playing different games, for example, where it's actually an advantage to learn quickly. And so that's a difference between the two things. And you know, the way we're using this project is sort of two little sticks to poke at, like how could we get an intersectional, a really intersectional disadvantage, right? Yeah. Thank you. Kalinda had a question. 
Yes, uh, this was really interesting. Uh, it was really fascinating. I would love to hear more about the details of the uh, how you did this. But my, my question is um, a clarification question. So what was the difference between model three and model four? Because I think you're, you're, you're increasing the strength of the intersectionality, uh, but I, I wasn't clear on how you operationalized that. Thanks. And actually, as you say this, I realized I was unclear. So we sort of did these first three models increasing the strength of the intersectional group, the meaningfulness of it. And then the fourth model was more of like a, how would you combine um, size and power at these two effects uh, to show intersectional disadvantage and make it kind of slight, you know, have something where you can tell a slightly more realistic story about why you would have a size difference across one intersection and a power difference across another. And so that was meant to just sort of show a slightly different thing than the increase and increasing um, effect, if that makes sense. Okay, so, uh, so maybe maybe it's model two and model three. There, it's before you got to the model where you were, um, uh, I guess, moving the lever of power. You had a definition of, of intersectionality. And as I uh, recall, uh, one of the models, the two are the the, the Denny's are orthogonal, right? You have uh, you have a star or not, and you have a rough or, a red rough or not. Uh, and then you went to you progressed to a model where the group is learning specifically from their intersectional group, right? Yeah. Uh, which is different from the prior. And then the next one was what in terms of operationalization of the intersection? Good. Okay, so there are two ways in which they could either pay attention to their component identity groups or they could pay attention to the intersectional identity group. And one way is how they learn and like who they learn from. And then the other way is how they decide to treat other people, how they strategize, right? So who they will demand high or low from. And when we move from model two to model three, we go from in model two, in their sort of first arena, they pay attention to belly rough and deciding how to treat people. Like, do I demand high of you or low of you? And in the other interaction they pay, or sorry, <laughs> belly star or red rough, in the other interaction they pay attention to the roughs. And then in model four, they pay attention only to the intersectional identity group. So they start to say only if you're a star belly red rough, here's how I treat you if you're a star belly gray rough, here's how I treat you. And I have a separate rule for each of the four groups I might interact with. So gotcha. now only learn from in their intersectional group and treat each group as an intersectional group rather than as component identity groups. And are you assuming um, and at the beginning of the model state that you're giving them the rules of how to treat each group or are they truly learning over time? The latter. In initial assumptions, okay. Gotcha. Exactly. So in these models, and you know, I sort of went fast on the details of this, but they're always initialized with entirely random strategies. They don't have any rules at the beginning about how they're going to treat anyone. And then over time, through these patterns of interaction, or sorry, through these many interactions, these patterns fall out from the learning process. Okay, thank you for that clarification. I had a question as well. Uh, so it's very interesting. Um, I was just thinking about the idea that, um, you know, it, it seems like there's an implicit assumption that the characteristics that form these identity groups or generate these identity groups are kind of neutral in a sense. But what if, you know, you could imagine a world where sort of small groups arise because of, because they have sort of characteristics that are exclusive and highly coveted, right? So you could think of like, professional athletes or movie stars, um, celebrities, medical doctors, something like that. And there, you know, the power would maybe run in the opposite direction. So are, have you considered contexts in which, you know, maybe the identity groups uh, or, or, or there's, there's sort of this uh, idea of exclusivity that generates the groups um, and, and how it would change your potential conclusions? Yeah, good. And I think there are a few different sorts of scenarios where there are reasons why groups are small. So one has to do um, with eliteness. And I think the most relevant one here has to do with social class. I mean, you don't have large 
upper classes. You have small upper classes and large lower classes, right? And then the other has to do with minority status when you have, for example, immigrant groups or um, different kind of migrant communities where you tend to have small minorities composed of a group that maybe has a different cultural, ethnic, or racial identity. Um, so one sort of interesting thing, and this is now going a little afield from this project, but one interesting thing about this size effect is that the general effect is that the smaller you are, the kind of faster you learn about the outgroup because you interact with them more. And as I mentioned, this is what this does is contextual. So I was really looking at the context in which this causes disadvantage in bargaining um, is such a context generally, but in other contexts, as I mentioned, it can cause an advantage if there's some reason why learning quickly is good for you. And a general effect is that learning quickly kind of doubles down on um, social status quo. So if you are in a small advantage group and a lot of people are already kind of deferring to you and you learn quickly to respond to that deferment, you actually get an advantage. If you're in a small disadvantaged group and a lot of people are kind of treating you badly or with suspicion or aggression, and you learn to quickly respond to that, you get a disadvantage. Um, so, that world. Uh, we Just to explain, I just got home from vacation and all my pets are like, oh my God, I missed you. I have to be on your lap with you every moment. Like we all have to be right here. So that is why there's so much like drama in my room right now. Um, but yeah, so does that uh, sort of respond or answer this question? Yeah, no, I think so. Um, that makes sense. Thank you. Maybe, maybe you've done this. Um, it seems like another way to think about intersectionality is not in like interact, like add additivity in these average outcomes, but like whether there's cross spillovers across domains. So like in the, you know, hot dog and hammock example, like if you make a group more advantage than the hot dog domain, does that like change their behavior in the hammock domain? Um, and it seems like your model is like close to doing that if you haven't done it already. Yeah, I think that's um, very insightful. And we have thought about that in the like, so you could say that, you know, you have a kind of work domain and that determines how much money you bring home. And then that shapes how bargaining would happen in a home domain um, over say amount of labor that you do. And so in that situation, you'd have sort of two domains where the effects of one are impacting the other. And we think there are like lots of ways that you would see intersectional effects from these like more specified types of interactions between the domains. Um, basically the reason we didn't do those models or include those in the paper had to do with like space reasons. And also because we were trying to do sort of the most minimal thing first where we don't make any assumptions about why there would be impact between them, except for size and power, right? And just see like, do we get an intersectional effect? Um, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that. Yeah, I mean, it's like, couldn't you, so I mean, in, in some of the graphs you're showing, it was like, you're changing the P1 and Q1 at the same time. So I guess I'm just thinking it's like, you know, if you change just one of those, you know, how does, how does it affect the other domain? I mean, it, it, it seems like the, you know, like you have you have the simulations ready to go. Um, so yeah, in fact, I mean, we ran all the variations. You know, I'm showing it on the graph that we're making both of the groups larger because that makes for a very easy graph to show. Um, but you know, we looked at all. You know, this group is large and that group's small, and that one's small and that one's large. And um, what happens in those cases is everything kind of in between, as you would expect. You know, as this group gets larger, there component, you know, the, all the intersectional identities that have that largeness tend to be advantaged and ditto for the other group. That was a really great talk. And um, yeah, thanks again for, it was really interesting to see how game theory could be used to think about intersectional disadvantage.